will be releasing the ducks very soon. Yeah, we will come back up this way. So at that point, the ducks should be in the river or being scooped out of the river. We'll find out. Guys, I haven't ever done a tour on the duck day, so I'm in it with you. It's exciting. Hi, folks. Now, right ahead on our right side, you see the white terracotta of the Wrigley Building. And the Wrigley Building, actually two buildings. So uh, the south portion of it was completed in 1921. The northern portion was completed in 1924. And you'll see the different balconies connecting them together. And it was designed in a Beaux-Arts style of architecture. Uh, Beaux-Arts is a French style, uh, known for a lot of detail, a lot of decoration. You'll certainly see that on the facade of the Wrigley Building. But the clock tower itself was modeled after the Gerardo Cathedral in Seville. That's where the architects Graham, Anderson, Probst, and White gained their inspiration. And of course it was built for the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. However, Wrigley sold the building just a few years back, so they no longer, longer occupy it, but it does retain its name. Now one thing to notice, the height of the Wrigley Building is the same height of the Trump Tower's next setback. And you'll see that the next two setbacks on the Trump Tower are at the height of the next two buildings around the corner. So the Trump Tower will get a great view of it uh, once we clear the Michigan Avenue Bridge. And it is the second tallest building here in Chicago currently. And it was designed by Adrian Smith uh, back in 2009 was when it opened. So you can see the setback heights at the same heights of the buildings around it. Also, uh, Adrian Smith shows a color scheme to transition the white of the Wrigley Building into the silver of the Trump Tower into the black of the AMA Plaza right around the corner. All that's done on purpose. Uh, Smith considers himself a contextual architect. Um, and what that means is he takes a look at the world around him when he's designing. He doesn't just like plop his building down like there's not any other buildings around it. He looks at those buildings and allows them to inspire his postmodern designs. Now the Trump sign, that's new. Uh, that just showed up a little over a month ago. It's created a little bit of controversy. Some people hate it. Some people couldn't care about it. Uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel has said that it's tasteless and should be taken down. <laughs> Donald Trump responded, it's magnificent, and I have literally thousands of people emailing and calling me saying how much they love it. <laughs> Which, I'm not gonna say he's delusional, Maybe they are, but I gotta believe people have better things to do with their lives. But, all, and, but then some people love it. So ultimately, uh, it was approved by the city. Good, everybody's hearing working? Nice. Sometimes we gotta clear people out of our way. There's a lot of traffic on the river today. But the sign was approved, so it's not going anywhere. But they might pass new laws preventing signs of that nature. Here to the right, you have the Black AMA Plaza. Uh, that is the tallest and final design by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Uh, Mies van der Rohe is considered the father of modern architecture. And modern is a style, uh, sometimes referred to as the international style. And Mies van der Rohe famously said, less is more. And that's what you'll see in the simple steel and glass boxes of the modern style. Mies van der Rohe uh, was originally from Germany, but he fled uh, before World War II, and he would ult ultimately make it here to Chicago. Uh, this is the one building we see of his along the river, uh, but we have a ton of buildings of Mies van der Rohe's designs here in the city, and we have a lot of other architects who were influenced by that less is more design of Mies van der Rohe. Now if you want to go about as far away as possible from that less is more style, we'll just look right here to our right. With these two towers, uh, officially known as Marina City, sometimes affectionately referred to as the Corn Cob Towers. And they were designed by Bertrand Goldberg, opened in 1968. And they were designed as a city within a city. At the time of its construction, a lot of people were leaving Chicago for the summer. This building has 
restaurants, retail, a bowling alley, a movie theater, which is now home to the House of Blues, and a marina, of course. And so the idea was that why go to the suburbs when, well, you can have everything you want in one complex. Now, Bertrand Goldberg has a few famous phrases. His most famous is, there are no right angles in nature. And that's what you see in the circular designs of Marina City. Very few right angles, almost a flower petal-like shape there. We'll see in at least one more design of Goldberg as we go along today. Now, if somewhere in the recesses of your mind you have an image of a car flying out of the parking garage of Marina City into the river, you might have seen the movie The Hunter with Steve McQueen, or maybe a Geico insurance commercial from a few years back. They recreated that stuff. Otherwise, the cars safely exit that garage there. Here to the right, you have the red bricks of the Reed Murdoch Center. Reed Murdoch Center is an old warehouse from the 19-teens. Uh, it's been updated over the years. But, well, I'd like to point out the biggest update. You see, if you count the right bays of the windows, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. On the right side, skip the middle, and then on the left side, you have one, two, three, four, five. There's five on that side. Uh, the building is asymmetrical. But that's not how it always was. You see, when they were expanding LaSalle Street, they were passing underneath, uh, they just went ahead and cut off part of that building. Which is a great story of Chicago progress. Uh, especially in the 19th and 20th century. Nothing got in the way of that progress. Not even your building. Just take a little up the side there. Now here to the right, you'll see this building with the Chicago School sign on it. And then up towards the very top, you'll notice with the flags blowing in the wind, those glass office penthouse up there. And this building was also a warehouse from the 19 teens. It was actually a coffee warehouse. But then in the 1980s, they adaptively reused it um, and updated it, kind of gutted the inside, added those upper floors up there. And that's very common uh, with, well, the modern approach to those classic buildings, making them useful for our modern needs, but keeping a lot of the original design there. Now this gigantic building to our right is the Merchandise Mart. And the Merchandise Mart, when it opened in 1930, it was the largest building in the world. It has about 4.2 million square feet of space. It takes up two whole city blocks, and at one point had its own postal code. And it was designed as a wholesale facility for Marshall Fields. Marshall Fields was a big retail giant based here in Chicago. Um, in fact, those pillars there, uh, they are not the Pez Dispenser Hall of Fame. They are the Retail Hall of Fame. So you have Marshall Fields, Filene, Montgomery Ward. And so the building, unfortunately, was constructed right around the time the Great Depression was setting in. So ultimately, Marshall Fields had to sell the building. And he sold it in the 1940s to Joseph Kennedy patriarch of the Kennedy family. In fact, the Kennedys would own the building up until the 1990s. And nowadays, it is run by a New York firm. Uh, there's interior design showrooms in there, uh, office space, and a lot of trade shows happen there. Now, we're coming to a very important point in Chicago history. And this is known as Wolf Point. And Wolf Point is where the main branch of the river meets up with the south branch to our left and the north branch to our right. And if you were here back in the 1830s, you could look over to the left bank of the river and you'd see a tavern. And then you'd gaze across from that bank to the far bank and you'd see a tavern. And then you'd look over to the right side of the river over here on this bank and you'd see a tavern. That's right, three taverns right here. You can actually take a ferry back and forth to that bar hopping of its day. And I don't mention that just to remind you, hey, we've got a bar on this boat if you need anything to drink. That's back there to take care of you. But I really bring it up because in one of those taverns, the Saganash Hotel, that was where in 1833, the leaders of this area got together and created the town of Chicago. Four years later, they would officially incorporate the city of Chicago. And there's a, quite a few reasons for that 
um, and we'll go along with that, uh, or as we go along, I'll bring up why they created the town and city. But I do want to mention right here to our right, uh, the construction going on, literally seeing the ground floors of some of our new high-rises. We're going to have three new buildings constructed right here. That's great. They're going to be quite tall, which there was just a parking lot there before. Not so good for the folks over here at the Riverbend Condos, this white building to our left. You see right now, they have a spectacular view down the length of the river. Well, once those high rises go up, bye bye view. They're not too happy about it, but there's nothing they can do about it. They don't own the view. Here to the left, you have kind of this salmon colored building. And this was originally the American Cold Storage Warehouse from 1908. Then in the 1980s, Harry Weiss was tasked with, well, updating it into a residential building. They had to defrost it for about a year, and they also had to find a way to punch through those walls, because if you look at the balconies, you'll notice that the walls are four feet thick. So they actually had to do some engineering tricks to get through them. Harry Weiss also designed these river cottages. I said he loves triangles. Just look at those roofs there. Uh, also reminiscent of sails. And also there's porthole shaped designs, circular windows running up the side of the building. And all of that was uh, done on purpose. Harry Weiss definitely going for the nautical themes of the design there. Now, when those river cottages opened in the 1980s, they were very much ahead of their time. You see, for a long history, <laughs> as we've been living by this river, we've not treated it very well. In fact, we used to pollute it really badly. Uh, there were factories in this area, they would just dump their waste here. There's the infamous Union Stockyards, livestock waste dumped directly into the river. So, people didn't necessarily want to live along a polluted river. And even when it was starting to be cleaned up in the 20th century, the architecture along the river often reflected those attitudes. And nowhere is that made more evident than directly to our right. It's the beautiful East Bank Club. It's a high-end fitness facility, and that's about all there is to say about it. Uh, architecturally speaking, it's boring. It's almost as if it's been built with its back turned towards the river. So when they started passing new zoning ordinances in the 1980s, they actually used the East Bank Club as an example of the kind of buildings we don't want along the river. The kind of buildings we do want along the river? Oh, well you can see it right across from the East Bank Club here with Kinsey Park. We're gonna make a nice hairpin turn here on the North Branch, and you'll get a great view of these new townhomes. Uh, the final phase was just completed last year, been working on it for quite a while. And one of the things that these new zoning ordinances called for was that your building should be set back 30 feet from the river. And what that does is, well, it opens up a space for a river walk, uh, lawns, gardens, patios, trees. That's, well, that's really great for us, right? You get something better to look at than the, the back of the building. But it's also really nice for the folks who live here. The folks who work in this area are folks who just want to come down here, spend a little bit, bit of time along the river. And that's really a great illustration of the changing attitudes here. Um, we, are, we have started cleaning up this river because honestly, at one point, this river was absolutely toxic. And nowadays, it's only mildly polluted. So, and I bring that up because, well, you're not gonna go swimming in this river. If you do, you've made a mistake. But you've seen the kayakers out here. You'll see these party boats out. You'll see the tour boats. And apparently it's safe for rubber duckies too. Um, but we are cleaning it up. We are making progress. Um, but just to tell you also the changing attitudes, shoreline sightseeing has been in existence for 75 years. We actually just had our 75th birthday. So happy birthday, Shoreline. Um, please send any cake or letters to Jake. Um, but. For the majority of our history, we have been touring out on the lake. It's really only in the last couple decades that all of these river tours have started going. Um, so that shows you we've realized that this river uh, is definitely an architectural gem, and now it's starting to become more of a recreational gem here in Chicago. 
and you get some amazing views. Kinsey Street Bridge, then right behind it, the raised Kinsey Railroad Bridge. That railroad bridge uh, is from 1908, and it is a historic landmark. Uh, it was built for the factories that used to be in this area, but most of them have moved away. So they stopped using it in 2000. It still does function. In fact, once a year, Union Pacific lowers the bridge, runs a basically a, a truck with train wheels across it. Uh, and that's so that they can maintain the right of way on that bridge should they ever need it again. And you'll notice around a lot of our bridges these wooden pilings. Uh, they're basically telephone poles wrapped in chains. And when they were replacing the pilings back by the Kinsey Street Bridge, back in 1992, they actually fractured an old freight tunnel underneath the river. You see, underneath Chicago, there are miles and miles of freight lines that were built in the early 20th century to transport coal to and from the buildings. By the time you get to the 1950s, well, they stopped using them. And ultimately, they were abandoned besides power lines running through them. So when that tunnel was fractured in 92, well, pretty soon the Chicago River started rushing in. Next thing you know, the basement of the Merchandise Mart is flooded. Then the basement of over a dozen other buildings in the Loop are completely flooded. The Loop, by the way, that's our financial district.